Hi, and welcome to today's Zoe podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Wolf, co-founder and CEO of Zoe, and I'm joined by my two guests, Dr. Sarah Berry and Dr. Will Bolsowitz, to discuss some groundbreaking new scientific research which was published today, linking inflammation to the food we eat. So today, what we'd like to cover is what is inflammation? Why is reducing inflammation so valuable for long-term health? How can the food we eat actually cause inflammation? And indeed, is inflammation more important than calories when we think about food? Finally, what can you, our listeners, do to reduce your own inflammation? My two wonderful guests today are firstly Sarah Berry, one of the world's leading experts on large-scale human nutrition studies and on the impact of fat on metabolism and cardiometabolic disease. Sarah is a reader in nutritional sciences at King's College London, where she has run over 30 randomized human clinical trials. Sarah has also helped to design and run Zoe's PREDICT studies, which are the largest in-depth nutritional studies in the world. We also have Will. Will Bolsowitz is a practicing gastroenterologist. He's an internationally recognized gut health expert, and he's also the New York Times best-selling author of the book Fiber Fueled. Uh, he's also a member of Zoe's scientific advisory board. If at any point you want to learn more about this topic, then do go online to joinzoe.com forward slash podcast. I hope you're as excited as me to dive into this. So let's get started right at the beginning. And I think let's start with this question of what is inflammation and why is it important? So over to you, Sarah. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, and thanks for the lovely introduction. So inflammation, is a, it's important to note, it's actually a normal physiological response. So it's our body's actual natural defense to attack. So imagine you cut your finger and it starts to swell. That's actually your immediate inflammatory response to that effect, uh, you know, that attack. And typically it resolves very quickly, but it's actually quite a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, it's a normal physiological beneficial process, but if it's prolonged over long periods of time, sustained and repeated, you have these repeated attacks, it can actually have unfavorable effects on the body. And we now know that many chronic diseases are underpinned by these, what we call low grade inflammation, where you have this sustained, prolonged, very low grade inflammation. And these are diseases like type two diabetes, some cancers um, and cardiovascular disease. And Will, I know you deal with inflammation a lot actually coming into your normal practice. Is there anything you'd sort of add as a, as a practicing physician? Yeah, I, you know, I think, um... It's, what's interesting to me is to put inflammation into an evolutionary context. We evolved to have inflammation as our friend, something intended to protect us. You know, if you think about where we were 10,000 years ago or more, the number one cause of death was, was uh, disease, was viruses and um, uh, infectious disease. And we developed inflammation for that. And what's fascinating to me is that what was meant to be our friend has turned into, in some ways, the enemy within the modern world, where things that happen when inflammation gets activated, you know, for example, a couple, couple things that I think are interesting, we actually get more insulin resistant, higher blood pressure, and higher blood lipids during chronic inflammation. And that was intended where if we're fighting an infection, that actually increases our likelihood of survival. And yet here we are in the 21st century and these things that we evolved to protect us when we were cavemen have now become the enemy because we are perpetually activating the inflammatory mechanism. And those things that we were supposed to be protecting ourselves from, you know, for example, infections or, um, or uh, even cancer, for example, when we chronically activate our immune system, chronic inflammation, we actually reduce our ability to fight against those things. And so, so part of the problem that we have in the 21st century is that rather than allowing inflammation to work the way that it's supposed to, which is acutely like work right now and then go away and get back to normal, rather than that, what we have is we have just perpetual, ongoing, persistent inflammation, rising our insulin resistance, rising our blood pressure, rising our blood lipids. And this is why you see downstream the development of these latent diseases that Sarah was referring to. I mean, six, six of the top 10 causes of death, Jonathan, six of the top 10 causes of death are latent diseases that have been connected to increased chronic inflammation, coronary artery disease, cancer, stroke, type two diabetes, 
uh, Alzheimer's disease and chronic kidney disease. All of these things are connected to chronic inflammation, not to mention autoimmune disease, not to mention osteoporosis, not to mention depression. So the message is a bit of information is good. In fact, it's necessary, it keeps us alive, but this ongoing consistent inflammation is bad and something that we see underpinning a lot of these diseases. So then the question I think is, how does food fit into this, right? So I think we sort of understand this idea um, that you might hurt yourself uh, and get inflammation, but how does food cause inflammation, Sarah? And does it matter? So we're starting to understand that food um, can be uh, favorable in terms of inflammatory responses, but also can be unfavorable. So we need to think about kind of both, both sides of the story. And it's not necessarily the food itself that causes the inflammation, but it's the metabolic processes. So the processes that are involved when we digest the food that stimulate downstream inflammation. Okay, so assuming your, your breakfast contains a mixture of nutrients, which most of our meals contain, so we're talking fat, carbohydrate, protein, uh, fiber. What happens is, is when we consume these meals, in our blood, we absorb uh, glucose, which comes from the carbohydrates in the meal, which we tend to refer as our blood sugar response. And we absorb triglycerides in the blood, which comes from the fat in the meal, which we can refer to as our blood fat response. And what we know is that when we consume mixed meals, we have a very short, sharp rise in our blood sugar response. So it peaks around 30 minutes, returns to baseline around two hours. And we have a slower, more graded rise in our blood fat response peaking around four hours and returning to baseline after about eight hours. Now, imagine how we typically eat food. So we typically have maybe two to three main meals a day, two to three snacks a day. So what happens is, is over the day, you've got these continual spikes in, in these blood sugar circulating, and then you have more, this more slow graded uh, increase in blood fat that builds up gradually over the day. Each time you're eating, the fat in the meal is kind of adding or superimposing onto the fat response from your previous meal. Your blood sugar will have returned to baseline typically, but then you're having this other short, sharp rise. And we call these postprandial responses. So we refer to this as postprandial glycemia, which many people might have heard of, which is this increase in blood sugar that circulates. And we call the increase in blood fat postprandial lipemia. And so postprandial is just the word for meaning post-eating in that immediate period. But what it actually means is we spend most of our time in this postprandial state of what we call metabolic flux. So we spend most of our time having just consumed meals, you know, in this kind of flux of blood glucose, blood sugar um, and blood fat. And what we now know is that these increases in circulating blood fat and circulating blood sugar stimulate a kind of downstream cascade of what are unfavorable effects. And this culminates in an inflammatory response. It culminates in the release of lots of different inflammatory uh, mediators. And so whilst again, we talk about how inflammation is a normal physiological response. Yes, this inflammation that happens after you eat is a normal physiological response to eating a meal. But the problem is, is when we're having these repeated excursions, so these repeated peaks and dips and these repeated um, elevations in blood fat over the day, we then go from this very short, short inflammation that we talked about at the beginning to this more prolonged chronic low grade inflammation. And we now know that actually many of the unfavorable effects elicited from foods actually are underpinned by these, what we call this postprandial inflammatory uh, response. I, I wanted to ask Sarah a question because, um, you know, blood sugar, I think many people who are listening to this podcast are probably more familiar with the idea of blood sugar, which it acutely rises. It goes up very quickly after a meal, comes back down. And within a few hours, you're back to your baseline again. You know, you could have breakfast and by the time you're ready to eat lunch, your blood sugar is back to normal. Sarah, could you describe for us how the, the lipid response after a meal is different? Like, what does that look like? How long does it take for it to rise? And when does it go back to normal? So typically, it will very slowly reach a peak around four hours in most people. And typically, it will return to baseline around eight hours. But given that we typically would consume our next meal, before it's returned to baseline. And typically actually, while it might be joint at the peak concentration, you have this kind of graded step-like increase quite often over the day. 
So it's just going up and up and up. And actually for a lot of people not returning to baseline until you know way past midnight, depending on when you obviously eat your last meal. So, so basically there's almost like a ratcheting that occurs during the course of the day. You could potentially continue to ratchet up with every subsequent yeah. meal because you're within that eight hour window. And, and also, you know, thinking about this eight hours, like basically it reaches a plateau, right? And it continues to remain elevated for eight hours before it starts to go down. And many people are continuing to eat within that eight hour window, literally on a 24 hour cycle every single day. Some people have uh, just a window of six hours where they're sleeping at night and then they wake up and they start eating again. So effectively they could be persistently in this cycle. Am I right? hundred percent. And this is why it's really important that we think about what's happening in this post prandial this post-eating state. Typically you're asked by your doctor, you know, come in fasted, I want to measure your fasting glucose or your fasting lipids. But actually we only spend for most people about four hours where our blood is in that metabolically fasted state. And it's what's happening the rest of that 18, 20 hours a day that I think is really important. And this is where a lot of the nutritional science evidence is now really shifting that we need to look at what's happening after you've consumed meals because it's these postprandial responses after you've consumed meals that's actually underpinning the long-term effect of foods on our health and it's a real so shift Sarah, in the way that just to, we're just to make this, this understood for, for all of us that means we can't just think about food in yep. terms of calories that's not the only way in which food um uh affects our, our health um you're saying that actually because of this like these long time periods particularly to do with things that have um fats with them but also um with uh, with with sugars that we really need to understand how are these affecting um these mechanisms that cause inflammation and that depending upon what we eat we can have very different profile during um during 24 hours is that is that is that right Absolutely. So this isn't about our energy intake, how many calories we're having. This is about the types of foods we're eating, the amount of fat and sugar, um, but also how we as individuals um, elicit different metabolic responses to, you know, quite often the same food where you'll see very different uh, inflammatory responses. Well, and, and I'll, I'll just, you know, jump in and say as a practicing clinician, the, w the way that we will approach these issues is tap typically with a fasting blood draw, right? So when we measure lipids, we will typically measure lipids fasting, including the triglycerides, which is what we're looking at, we're going to look at in the study in a moment. Typically, we will measure the, the fasting triglycerides or, you know, blood sugar, we'll, we'll measure the fasting blood sugar. Does that give us insights into our metabolic health? Yes, of course it does. But uh, effectively, what I'm hearing from you, Sarah, is that we, we need to start looking at these values after a meal, because from a metabolic perspective, this is like a stress test, right? So if we want to know how healthy the heart is, you don't just have a person stand there and size them up and look at their blood pressure and things like that while they're standing in front of you. What you do is you put them on a treadmill, you make them run, and then you see what the heart is capable in that functional setting, right? I mean, is that, is that kind of what we're talking about here is that we need to start thinking about postprandial as being more indicative of our metabolic health than a fasting blood draw, which is what is typically being done in the clinic these days. Yeah, I love that analogy of putting someone on the treadmill. I'm going to use that for my lectures in future. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that another way of looking at it as well is it's like giving us a peek into the future. So if we were to measure someone's fasting glucose, you and I could have exactly the same fasting glucose. So we could have have similar metabolic health, supposedly according to our fasting glucose, similar type two diabetes risk, cardiovascular disease risk. Now, if we do this metabolic stress, where we look at our postprandial responses, you might have a really different postprandial response to me. And what we now know is that certainly there's evidence for this in glycemia, and it's now emerging for the blood fat, so the lipemia responses, that if we can measure people's postprandial responses, it gives us a hint, you know, maybe 10, 20 years to what might go on to happen in the future. So it allows us that better discrimination. So you could have, like I said, you know, a perfect postprandial. I might have a high postprandial, but we might have the same fine. And then this, the likelihood, therefore, is that I will go on to develop 
some of these diseases that are related to this low grade inflammation and you'll be sitting happily um, uh, uh, very healthily. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's interesting. You know, I, I don't want to jump too far ahead. I think we're about to get into it um, in terms of the findings from your study, Sarah. But I, I know that they've looked at patients who develop cardiovascular disease. You know, whether it's um, coronary artery disease or stroke, and they've looked at these patients and they look in the postprandial state. Which, by the way, this is these are research studies. This is not typically done in the clinic, and they found that they have an exaggerated lipemic response after a meal. So people who are at increased risk for coronary artery disease or stroke seem to really spike their triglyceride levels after a meal more so than the average person. And I think that provides us some in insights and some context as we start to move into the findings from your, from your study. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something that's been emerging over the last 10 years or so that we know that actually this postprandial spike in TAG is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And what we're starting to understand is it's most likely because of this downstream inflammation that we see. And we, we need And, and you said TAG, need... you're talking again about these lipids and you say triglycerides, I think for our audience, you know, when we go yeah. and, and, and see our physician, you, could you give us an example of, of words we're used to hearing uh, when we talk about this, you know, is cholesterol, for example, is related to this. Can we just explain for a second? Yeah, so um, we use collectively a term called blood lipids, and blood lipids is a term that we would use to encompass cholesterol that everyone's familiar with, um, and triglycerides, which I, I think less people are familiar with. When we talk about cholesterol, we often talk about HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and total cholesterol. And this is just really referring to the particles in which cholesterol circulates in our blood. So HDL cholesterol, we often uh, refer to as being good cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, we refer to as being bad cholesterol. And this is all related to very specialized proteins that are in these particles that actually determines where the cholesterol goes. So for HDL cholesterol, the cholesterol actually goes back to be removed from sites like the lining of the blood vessels. But for LDL cholesterol, these proteins actually deliver it to sites where we don't necessarily want it to be delivered like the lining of the blood vessels. That's a really simplistic way of trying to explain it. So slightly oversimplistic, consider the complexity. That, that's all right, Sarah, <laughs> perfect. And this is back to this same chain of this idea that if you can't metabolize this well, then you start to have these sort of, these negative inflammatory responses, you know, taking us to sort of what Will was talking about, about you know, cardiovascular disease, um, yeah. I believe also potentially, you know, linked to, um, to many other diseases as well. So before, um, maybe let's, let's, let's switch to talking about the, the paper before we run out of time, just talking about this, because it's so interesting. Um, Sarah, you just published this brand new paper, uh, published in American Journal yeah. of Clinical Nutrition, which is one of the top uh, peer reviewed journals for nutrition in the world. We start um, by just explaining the study itself um, and the amazing effort uh, that you were involved in to measure these responses in a thousand people. And then let's talk a bit about what the, uh, the discoveries themselves are. Okay, so I don't think we've actually even said what the PREDICT program of research is yet. Um, so just to quickly let everyone know so this study came out of the PREDICT program. Uh, studies, which are the world's largest personalized nutrition studies, really aiming to unravel how we respond to food, how much variability there is in our response to food, and what determines this variability. Um, and this study is uh, focusing on our PREDICT-1 study, which was a hugely ambitious study. Um, it was in over a thousand individuals where we undertook really um, in-depth, high-scale, high-precision, you know, with great breadth, um, study of people's postprandial responses to set meals. And typically, and I, I know you'll probably want to ask this, Jonathan, typically the postprandial studies that we do involve about 20 people. So I spent 25 years studying postprandial responses to food. And my most ambitious study prior to PREDICT involved 50 people, which was a big feat. So I know when we first discussed this study, I thought you were absolutely crazy to say that <laughs> we could do a thousand people in a year. Um, Anyway, we did. <laughs> um, and so we had a thousand people complete these really tightly controlled clinic postprandial tests. And these consisted of people attending a clinical research facility. These were predominantly twins from the Twins UK cohort. 
And after an overnight fast, we gave them a standardized breakfast and a standardized lunch in the form of a muffin. And these were standardized to have exactly the same macronutrients. So exactly the same uh, protein, carbohydrate, fat and fiber content. And then we took sequential blood samples. So about every 15 minutes over a six hour period, we collected blood so that we could look in depth. So you just their... keep sticking a needle into their arm every 15 minutes, do you? Like a pin cushion. Doesn't sound not like quite, that much fun. We're not quite that mean. <laughs> <laughs> we actually put a cannula in, which is a fixed needle. So we withdraw blood nearly every 15 minutes, but we're not as mean to keep sticking the needle in. Um, but they're really challenging studies because for six hours, someone's sitting there with a, a cannula in, you know, with blood draws being constantly taken. And this is why actually so little is known about postprandial uh, metabolism. More is known about the postprandial blood sugar responses because they occur, like we've discussed in that two hour period. But because the blood fat responses are so prolonged, they're so difficult to do, to get people in to do it, to run them. Um, anyway, I digress on the, the challenges that I faced in my career running these studies. So going back to the predict studies, we collected in over a thousand people multiple samples over a six hour period from which we looked at circulating fat, sugar, and something called metabolomics from which we were able to measure very specific inflammatory measures. We also collected other data that's been important in um, this part of our analysis as well. So we looked at something called visceral fat mass, which is basically referring to the fat around your stomach, so your abdominal fat. We looked at their microbiome using specialized sequencing techniques, which fits in with the overall PREDICT program of research we've been doing. So um, in this paper, we found in line with all the results that we're finding with our PREDICT program of research. First, there's huge variability in people's responses to food. So we found huge variability in people's postprandial resp uh, inflammatory response. And this is new because people haven't looked at this. So we found more than 20 fold difference in how different individuals responded to exactly the same food in their postprandial inflammation. And so this is looking over these time periods after consuming these standardized meals, showing that maybe you and myself and Will might have a 10 or 20 fold difference in our postprandial responses. And so we Sarah, also, does that mean that, for example, you know, Will, who we know eats so well, has no inflammatory response to something, and maybe I, I'm eating exactly the same thing and I have, I have this really big inflammatory response? Is that, is that how I understand what you're saying? Um, so we don't know whether it's because Will eats particularly well, but what we did find is there's huge variability and we're starting to unravel what's causing that. We do know, for example, that males have a higher postprandial inflammatory response to the same meal. We know postmenopausal women have a higher postprandial response. We know that the higher your BMI, so the more overweight you are and the higher your abdominal fat, this visceral fat mass, the higher your postprandial inflammatory uh, response is. You know, what we need to do is really tease apart as well how the different types of food might impact that. And that's something that we really want to go on and delve deeper into. So you've done this massive research. You've discovered that actually when you eat food, you have this inflammatory response and you now measure that on a thousand people. You've seen all of this um, variation between um, people. Um, what does that mean then for uh, you know how we think about the link between food and inflammation? So I think many people tend to think about you know sort of food as good or bad. Um, is that a right way to think about this? You know, are all foods causing dietary inflammation? Is there like a fixed list that we should tell everybody? How, what is this? Um, what's this research telling us? So I think to pick up on your point, you know, we would never label any food as just good or bad you know, the way we consume foods is a dietary pattern. So uh, with foods have syn having synergistic effect, what this research has shown is that there is this huge variability. And we've seen that one of the biggest determinants in causing this postprandial inflammatory response is the increase in circulating blood fat. And so what we were able to do with this study is look at the relative contribution of the different nutrients in the meal and this is what hasn't been looked at before, to look whether is it the circulating blood sugar that's important, is it the circulating blood fat that's important? And what we found was that whilst both were associated with this postprandial inflammatory response, what was novel here is we found it was particularly the postprandial fat 
circulating that it was associated with the inflammation, suggesting that what we should be doing then when we think of dietary strategies to reduce postprandial inflammation is yes, focus on carbohydrates and focus on the, the glycemic response, but particularly look at what's causing the increase in circulating blood fat and also how we can minimize the subsequent inflammation that, that this elicits. So you're going to tell me that I shouldn't drink, I shouldn't eat sugar all day, but if I just swap to eating nothing but butter all day, I'm not in a good place either. Is that how I understand this, Sarah? Well, absolutely. Anyone that knows anything about nutrition, um, and I know you know this yourself, but, and I'm sure many people listening will know, it's about variety. So it's about having a variety of food, which we know is good for our microbiome, but also good for so many other um, as aspects of our health and about consuming fat and carbohydrates, the right type of fat and the right amount of fat for your unique metabolism. But I think it's important to, to pull up on that, that it might be that you have particularly pronounced postprandial fat responses, and therefore for you, we might need to be thinking more about how we modify that in terms of inflammation um, compared to Will, who might have a higher um, you know, blood sugar response and might have actually very... Um, healthy blood fat responses. Fantastic. So um, I think that's a great um, transition to this question about, so what can we do to reduce inflammation? So I think, you know, I'm listening to this thinking, wow, like that sort of recurrent inflammation sounds like one of the number one things that I need to worry about if I'm thinking about my long-term uh, health. Um, uh, I know we've talked uh, at other points about how that itself is actually linked into weight gain. So, which is itself tied into this um, uh, bad health. So what can, we, what can we do to reduce inflammation and what does this research sort of um, uh, help us to understand about, about the changes we can make? Um, so I think we can think of a, a kind of two sort of strands of how we can reduce it. So firstly, we've shown that this increase in circulating blood fat and blood sugar elicits or downstream this inflammatory response. So therefore, what we want to do is think of what are the strategies we can do to reduce this, the circulating fat and glucose, so reduce what we call the lipemia and the glycemia. So that's one approach we can take. The other is what strategies can we implement to actually attenuate, so dampen down, kind of turn out the fire of inflammation once it's actually uh, occurred. And so there's strategies we know of um, that will reduce lipemia and glycemia. So, you know, we, we all know that, um, you know, we should be reducing the amount of processed foods we have. So we want to reduce these ex excursions in blood glucose responses. So consuming high fiber rich foods, consuming foods in their original matrix. And I know I mentioned this at the beginning. So by this, I mean food in their original structure. They, breaking down the structure of food changes how we metabolize that food. And we know this from work we've been doing at King's and some other researchers. So if you were con to consume whole rolled oats, for example, versus really finely ground oats, you would have a very different glycemic response. The whole rolled oats would actually cause quite a blunted slow response, which you would therefore predict to cause less of a postprandial inflammatory response. But the finely ground oats that you have in some of these processed cereals very quickly digestive causes sharp rise in glucose and therefore you have this bigger inflammatory response so we can we can implement things like that to reduce our postprandial sugar response and then to reduce our postprandial fat response firstly we know that a high refined carbohydrate diet increases our fasting uh, blood fat levels our fasting triglyceride levels which are related to the postprandial response so we can minimize that but we also know there's other dietary strategies. So we know that omega-3 fatty acids, particularly those found in fish oil, can reduce our postprandial lipemic responses. We know if we minimize our alcohol intake, um, if we consume too much, that can, can reduce it. And also lifestyle modifications such as exercise. Um, to reduce the inflammatory response, which is the, the other kind of strategy we can take, we know from studies that if you consume alongside a high fat meal or a high carb meal, um, bioactives that have um, antioxidant or anti-inflammatory properties, you can dampen down the postprandial response. So let's say I was to have a high fat meal one day um, and a glass of water with it. Um, I would have this short, sharp rise in the glucose and the triglycerides. 
and I would have a big increase in this postprandial inflammation. Let's say, say the next day I had a nice glass of red wine with polyphenols, or if I don't drink wine, I had maybe something like a glass of orange juice that's got vitamin C and antioxidant properties. Um, what would happen is I'd still have the same glucose and the same blood fat um, increase, but I would have less of an inflammatory response because it interacts with the pathways and attenuates that postprandial inflammatory response. So you can take away from that what, what you want. I'm not encouraging everyone to go and drink uh, wine with their breakfast, lunch and dinner. If you do, make sure it's red wine because it's got loads of polyphenols, which are these bio bioactors we talk about. But any of, any of, you know, most plant materials that have rich pigment, so, you know, the rich, the red, the greens, these contain polyphenols. And this is one of the reasons that we talked about earlier about the synergistic effects of food. So having your high fat meal with, um, you know, green leafy vegetables, peppers, all of these polyphenol rich foods will actually counterbalance any of the harmful effects from this inflammation. Brilliant, thank you, Sarah. And um, maybe to sort of bring this to a to conclusion, uh, one area we haven't really touched on very much is, um, is gut health and what you can do to affect the way that you have this inflammatory response. Is there any link between you know, what we've been talking about today and a lot of the other areas of the study that are sort of feeding into uh, all this Zoe research around gut health? Um, I think I can mention a few things on this, but then I think it would be good to get Will's thoughts on the broader aspects, because I know this is something he's got a, a lot of expertise in. Um, one of the measures that we used um, to measure inflammation is something called Glyc A, which is quite a novel measure that's emerging in, in research. It's a novel measure of inflammation. It's a very robust measure of whole body inflammation. And as part of the PREDICT study, we did look at the association between this novel measure of inflammation, Glyc A, and our gut microbiome. And we found that it was really closely associated. So we have a, a paper published in Nature Medicine on this, where we found that your fasting, but also your postprandial levels, levels of Glyc A, so inflammation, was strongly associated with microbiome composition. And specifically, we found that it was strongly associated with this microbiome signature that we identified of good and bad bugs. So the more Glyc A, so the more inflammation you had, the more bad bugs you had, the less inflammation you had, um, either at fasting or postprandially, um, the less of the good bugs you had. And I don't know whether, Will, this is something you would probably have a lot more insight into the mechanisms and why and what we can do about this. Yeah, I, mean, <clears throat> I think that this, um, the findings from your study, Sarah, are, are incredibly exciting because what you're showing for the first time is that this marker of inflammation, Glyc A, actually rises in the postprandial state. That's never been shown before. And I think that's one of the ma major takeaways here. And this Glyc A, this is a, this is a new emerging biomarker for chronic inflammation. One of the issues that we've had on the clinical side is that our markers for, you know, for example, cardiovascular risk are imperfect. So when we look at chronic inflammation, we're looking at things like CRP and CRP can vary wildly within the exact same person. You could draw two CRP values at the exact same time and get two different values. And so, so it's exciting because now we have this, this Glyc A and we're showing in your study that Glyc A is actually connected to postprandial lipemia that when your blood lipids start to rise, Glyc A starts to rise. And, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself, as you're speaking, Sarah, you're speaking about polyphenols and the protective effects of polyphenols, which of course we find in plants. Those are the colors of the plants. And I'm thinking to myself, fiber, fiber is another thing that is protecting us and helping to blunt these metabolic responses. And it's no surprise that a overall dietary pattern that maximizes a wide variety of plants and that includes a large amount of polyphenols and fiber protects us from these chronic inflammatory diseases that we're talking about. And it's no surprise that the opposite is true. I mean, there's certain foods that we know are not associated with a healthy dietary pattern. And when we study these foods within the context of postprandial lipemia, we find that their lipids go up when we study these foods with 
uh, markers of inflammation, we see that the, the infl inflammatory markers are going up. So I think, you know, one of the um, major takeaways from my perspective is that we're having, we're, we're seeing this all start to fall into place. The pieces of the puzzle are starting to fall into place where we're seeing this connection between the food choices that we make, our overall dietary pattern, our lipid response, and that this connects to our inflammatory response and chronic inflammation. And so I think that your, your study, Sarah, really is opening up the possibilities for future research in terms of looking at this in more detail. Yeah, and something I, I, Jonathan, I know we're going to finish up soon, but something I want to jump in that I, we've not mentioned and that, that really will brought to my mind when he was talking about this is another finding from the study was the taking the link with actual disease. The world's talked about this kind of diet microbiome, disease, inflammation, postprandial response link. What we were able to look at is how do those that have a higher postprandial inflammation um, fare out in terms of their disease risk. So we use something called the ASCVD risk calculator, which is a way that we can look at someone's predicted risk of developing cardiovascular disease. And we found that if you fell in the top 10% of postprandial inflammatory responses, so for those people, the top eliciting the highest postprandial inflammation, we found that they had a two-fold higher ASCVD risk score than the rest of the people in our, in our study. So they were two times more likely to be predicted to develop cardiovascular disease over a certain time period than those that had the lower response. And I think that's a quite, quite nice to think of, you know, as we finish these discussions that we've gone, you know, from the beginning to kind of technical stuff to actually what does this mean in our own cohort, as well as the fact that we know that this measure glyca from epidemiology, you know, is associated with lots of different disease. Uh, Will, did you want to pick up on that? Well, I think the other thing <clears throat> that I would point out, Sarah, is that these things, we, we look at them from a research perspective in isolation because we have to, that's how we study things. Yeah. But that's not the way that the body works. The body is all intertwined and connected. So we talk about the microbiome as if it's separate from our metabolic response. We talk about our food as if it's the separate entity. And yet what happens is this is all coming and merging together into one confluent process that makes you a human being. And we're just kind of isolating specific things in the interest of clinical research so that we can try to understand them better. But we know from your prior study, Sarah, with the predict using, using the predict data, we know from your prior studies that your dietary choices affect your gut microbiome and your gut microbiome affects your metabolism. There is a chain of events or there is a chain of how these are intertwined that's critically important. And then the other thing I just wanna add real quick, I think is important is that we also get very interested in sort of drilling down on one particular topic from a, um, uh, in, in popular sort of, in popular, uh, fitness culture or wellness culture. So people will look at, you know, just their blood lipid response and they get very curious or they, or they'll look at just their blood glucose or, and you know, there's all these things, there's all these microbiome tests out there. The beauty of what's happening with Zoe is that it's pulling all of it together in a comprehensive fashion. And one of the points from this study that we found is that this is not saying that blood glucose does not matter. Blood glucose clearly matters. We have an overwhelming amount of evidence to support that in other studies. But in this particular study, the blood lipid response after a meal proved to be the more important factor in terms of chronic inflammation, in terms of the inflammatory response. And this is why it's so important when you look at what we are doing with Zoe, both from a scientific perspective and in terms of being able to deliver the product to consumers so that they can get a good health outcome, because that's what they want. It's so important for people to see that you can't just look at one thing. You can't just look at the microbiome. You can't just look at your blood glucose. We are combining all of it, microbiome, blood glucose with the continuous monitor, lipid response, postprandial lipid response, standardized meals, 
so that people can actually get the information that they need because we're more complicated than just one thing. I mean, it's just, we, we need all of the information to really understand it. Yeah, I think that's key, Will, that what's so groundbreaking about the PREDICT research and what's so exciting for me as a, a researcher involved in it is that we're looking at the many interrelated factors. And this is what's not possible to do with many of the small scale studies where we look at single exposure, single outcome. You know, they're still incredibly useful and I'm not diminishing their value. But what I love about the work we're doing with PREDICT is just what you said, you know, spot on, that we are be able to look at all of these interrelated pathways, how they interact, their relative importance, and then look at these many different outcomes as well. And I celebrate, I celebrate the fact that we have a thousand people, you know, that we have a thousand people when typically you would get 20 or 60 people. I celebrate that we have a thousand people and can get this level of granular detail to be able to look at all these factors in combination at the same time. It's amazing. And we look forward to when we start to do studies with tens of thousands and indeed hundreds of thousands of people. So we're, we're at time and maybe just to wrap up, uh, we can leave our listeners with each of you with, uh, you know, the one or two sentence uh, advice on, on what would you recommend they change as a result of this study. Um, and in my case, I've been lucky enough to, uh, to participate in the study, have, uh, have all the feedback and, and saw that in fact, um, you know, my glycemic responses were much worse in fact, than my, my fat response. And so I've made pretty significant changes in terms of trying to eat a lot more healthy fat um, uh, in, in general. Um, if you were going to, to wrap up here with a, with a final uh, piece of advice, uh, Sarah, and then Will. Um, so I think this just adds to the whole body of research that we've been doing, showing, as I just said, that there's many different factors. So it's all multifactorial and that we shouldn't focus on a single nutrient, a single food. We should think of the diet as a whole improve our overall diet patterns um, whilst also enjoying our food. And we've got to remember that food is there to bring us pleasure. It's cultural, it's social, it's emotional. So most importantly, enjoy your food whilst actually thinking of the overall dietary pattern and the synergistic effect that food has. Yeah, so my, so my takeaway from this study, and I don't, I apologize for opening up a can of worms literally at, at 11.59 before it turns midnight. Um, but my, my takeaway from the study, I am fascinated by the blood lipid response after reading this study, Sarah. You know, I think it's so interesting to think about how, because we focus on blood sugar. I myself focus on blood sugar. And now yeah. let's, start, let's start to bring awareness to our blood lipid response after meals, this rise that you have described that takes four hours to peak and it stays elevated for eight hours or more. I've seen other studies that say 12 hours and it stays elevated for that period of time before it starts to come back down. And I think about my personal dietary choices, particularly late night snacks. And I'm thinking about how I need to give my body a rest from this inflammatory response that's taking place after meals. And late night snacks tend to be ultra refined, ultra processed foods, mm -hmm. which are more likely to ultimately give me this high lipid response. And then it's gonna persist through the night while I'm sleeping. And so from my perspective, I'm thinking about this in terms of the time restricted eating concept of eat dinner, enjoy your food, have dessert if you want it, but for me, making that rule that I'm going to try to avoid alcoholic beverages and snacks in the late evening immediately before going to bed, because that may carry into the next day in terms of inflammation. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sarah and Will. I think we've left many questions open that we may be able to come back to in the future. Um, if any of you would like to learn more about Zoe, about this paper, or about other nutritional science, uh, do go to joinzoe.com. That's J-O-I-N-Z-O-E.com forward slash podcast. Uh, until next time, thank you very much. Bye-bye from us.